Okay, so it's it started and I'll just pause it now and then Well, hello everyone and welcome. As Lisa said, I'm Laura Norsha. I'm the coordinator of the Ledger Seed Library and we're hosting the program this evening. A shout out also though to our co-sponsors, Mystic and Noank Library, Preston Public Library and the Public Library of New London who are also helping with this program. This evening, we're joined by Tim Watchman from Plantscape of New England. Tim is a Gales Ferry resident and has been a resident of Connecticut for over 30 years. Tim's a biologist by training and profession with over 25 years of experience as a research scientist. He is also certified in a secondary science education. A lifelong gardener and plant enthusiast, Tim has honed his skills in plant selection, design, pest and disease control, and ecological gardening approaches as a manager for many years in a large local garden center. He continually expands his knowledge through research, attending science-based landscape and gardening con conferences, and by exploring botanic gardens and natural habitats in New England and also throughout the country. His areas of special interest and expertise are ecological restoration and landscape design with native plants, as well as indoor gardening with tropical plants, especially orchids. Tim provides a variety of programs promoting ecological landscaping practices and environmental engagement to local residents. He is also an active member and supporter of the Society of Ecological Restoration, the Native Plant Trust, the Berkshire Botanical Garden, the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, and the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden in Miami. As Lisa also said, if you wouldn't mind responding to my email that I sent out with the Zoom link, and just as a reminder of where you're from, where your library is, what your hometown is, we'd really appreciate it uh, for statistic collecting and just because we're interested in finding out how you heard about our program. Also, just wanna mention, stay tuned for our other upcoming programs. We have one monthly throughout the gardening season, March through September. So we still have some nice programs coming up as well. But for now, I would like you to help me in welcoming Tim Watchman. Okay, thank you, Laura. I'll start by sharing my... screen. Okay, and I'll just arrange my desktop a little bit here. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to begin by thanking Laura and Lisa for hosting me tonight. Um, and also um, to the libraries, Ledger Library, Mystic Library, Preston, and the Library of New London for co-sponsoring. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, the title of tonight's talk is Becoming an iNaturalist in Homegrown National Park and creating pollinator pathways. Okay. And I'll begin by going to the Plantscapes website and bringing up some resources that I have there. Okay, the website is located at plantscapesne.com. And if you scroll to the bottom of the home page, um, there'll be a menu bar. Um, if you click on notes, it'll bring up a, a list of presentations and um, you can find becoming an iNaturalist in Homegrown National Park. If you click on notes, it will take you to my speaker notes for tonight's presentation. And I've tried to capture all the websites and books and people that I'll be mentioning. So um, all that information and some supplemental information as well is, is located in these speaker notes. Um, a few other things, I've created a link for pollinator pathways. And I'll um, speak in more detail about this uh, later in the talk, but there's a lot of information here on how to 
get set up on iNaturalist, how to um, join a pollinator pathway and how to create your own if you're interested in doing that. Um, also on the menu bar, there's um, some tips for ecological gardening. Um, I've tried to include a lot of things in there, practical information for homeowners and others that are interested in, in creating habitat. Um, and finally, if you go to Plantscapes events, um, I'll just point out that I just finished up a three-part series with Westerly Library. Um, in this talk, I'm kind of jumping into the middle of pollinator gardening, but if some of you wanna go and get some background, this three-part series is a, a good way to pick up some background information. And I'll be using a summary of these talks to kind of um, provide the background for tonight's presentation. And each of these talks has recordings um, listed. You can just click on the recording and it'll take you to a, a video of those talks. And this is also the place if you wanna come back um, probably by tomorrow, I'll have a, a link for the recording of this talk on, on this location as well. Okay, and now I'll go back to my slides and begin the presentation. Um, just a reminder, this is being recorded and um, the recording will be posted in a day or so. And um, I'll begin with um, some of the things I talked about in my presentation, Why Native Plants. And for me, the most important rationale for ecological landscapes is to conserve and enhance biodiversity. But there are many other advantages to putting native plants in your landscape as well. Um, they're much lower maintenance, so there's less watering and fertilizing, mowing and replanting. Um, so I talk about those things in, deal, in, in detail. Um, I also go into how to control invasive species and also the importance of keystone plants. And also I, I give some pointers on selecting and sourcing native plants. In the second talk in that series, called Planting for Native Pollinators. Um, planting lots of flowers can be great for pollinators, but the goal is really to create habitat that supports their entire life cycle. And the best way to do that is to create a, a layered forest edge meadow situation as shown in this picture. But we're not all able to do that. Um, you can create this kind of environment on a very small lot size, but if you're living in a city and you have a, a patio or a balcony, you can just as well put some native pollinator plants in containers and use those to support those pollinators. Um, every contribution, no matter how small, is important. The thing you want to... Um, shoot for though is perpetual bloom throughout the whole season so that the pollinators are supported from early spring until mid to late fall. Um, so I talk about that in this talk and um, I also give a, a, a discussion of pesticides as well which is a very important issue if you're trying to support pollinators. In the third installment called Enjoying Your Native Landscapes. Um, when you start putting native plants into your landscape, there's a lot of opportunities for exploration and discovery that those plants provide. Um, but it's documented that, that um, having a, a biodiverse environment 
in your neighborhood is very good for your well-being as well. And um, there's lots of ways you can, can connect with that environment. Um, you can plant edible native plants. You can create a, um, an area where you can go to unplug and reconnect with nature. And you can also engage with citizen science. There are a whole lot of opportunities out there for, for doing things like that. Right, and the, the take home message from that three part series is that native plants, pollinators, birds, and other wildlife are in trouble. And as humans, we can't survive and thrive without them. Um, but my message is that there are concrete things that each and every one of us can do to conserve and enhance biodiversity. And in the remainder of this talk, I'll describe some interrelated concepts and tools that we can all use to further this goal. And I'd like to begin this part of the talk with a, a mention of Doug Tallamy, who's been a leader for many, many years now in ecological restoration, um, especially within the human environment. And he's written several books, and I've listed two here that are very relevant to tonight's topic. Um, the first is Bringing Nature Home, which was published in 2007. And it's really Tallamy's manifesto on a need for a sustainable and biodiverse landscape. Um, and then um, another book is Nature's Best Hope, which was published in 2019. And this is a, a practical manual for those who have, have um, adopted the restoration viewpoint or more are interested in learning more about it. Um, but these two books together, um, if you go away from tonight's presentation and want to, to learn more about this topic in more depth, these two books are an excellent way to, to start to do that. So Doug Tallamy is an entomologist at the University of Delaware. And one of his major concerns is um, declines in bird populations. Uh, we've lost somewhere near 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And this is an indicator of um, biodiversity loss in general. And it's something we all need to be concerned about because um, as I mentioned, our own welfare is dependent on having healthy ecosystems. And Tallamy's most crucial insight is that native plants and insects and birds have an interdependent relationship and human well-being is reliant on the health of those relationships. And the way this works is that, that native plants absorb, well, plants in general absorb energy from the sun. And when insects feed on those plants, that energy is distributed out to the ecosystem. And birds in particular, um, the vast majority of songbirds um, feed on those caterpillars, especially when they're raising their young. And um, then birds complete this cycle by eating and distributing the seeds of the native plants. So um, humans now have a, a critical role in sustaining these relationships. And the way we do that is by avoiding the destruction of their habitat, but also restoring habitat, moving towards health, healthier ecosystems. And we can do that by eliminating or avoiding pesticide use, but also very importantly, slowing climate change. And these are all things that are very important for our own food security and also our psychological well-being. And there's a lot of science to, to back those points up now. So the way that Tallamy 
translated this concern for biodiversity into a, a practical project was to create the concept of homegrown national park. And he's got a really nice website um, around this idea. You can get a lot more information there. You can also, if you're putting native plants into your landscape, you can um, put yourself on the map as being a, a creator of habitat. But this is something that we can all get involved in. And um, it's an effort that one, works one person at a time, one landscape at a time. But if we all get involved in this, we can start restoring a lot of biodiversity. And just to get an idea of what the potential is for, for this homegrown national park, uh, the US national park system has holdings of about 84 million acres. And the largest of those parks is St. Elias in Alaska at 13 million acres. But if you look at this map up in the upper left-hand corner, this is a, a map of the acreage in the US that's planted in turf grass. And the first thing that you'll notice is that these, um, this turf grass, grass acreage is concentrated in suburban areas around cities and other population centers. And if you add all of that turf grass together, it amounts to about 40 million acres. And Doug Tallamy's point is that if we just committed to converting half that amount of turf grass into habitat that supports biodiversity, we would have about 20 million acres of new habitat that would create something that would be the largest national park in this country. So there's a, a huge amount of potential in this idea and it's something that each of us can um, find a way to contribute to. Um, one of the beauties of this idea is that it's an entirely grassroots effort. It doesn't require presidential leadership or an act of Congress or buy-in from corporate capitalism. There's something that each and every one of us can, can do to further this project. Um, I've shown some of those possibilities in this slide. So we can join together to create um, pollinator gardens and other uh, native plantings around our town halls and in our municipal parks. We can make good use of parking lot islands and median strips. Uh, we can plant up some of our parks into these meadows and, and forest habitats. Um, Another possibility is to add native plantings to um, corporate campuses and educational campuses, um, commercial sites. And then in our residential properties, um, we can create patio gardens or pollinator gardens, or if we have more space to work with, we can think about converting a lot of that lawn, which is, um, you know, not very interesting and requires a lot of um, maintenance and creates a lot of greenhouse gases. By converting that, that lawn, um, you can create a, a very vibrant environment, very interesting environment with a lot more biodiversity. Another way of thinking about extending and building homegrown national park is um, something that the, the Pollinator Pathway Organization has been working on. Um, this is another grassroots effort. And um, I'll, I'll again refute, 
refer you to their website because there's a lot of very valuable information there. You can find um, information on the pollinator pathways that are being built, um, how you can build pollinator friendly habitats in your, on your own property. There's a lot of resources about native plants and, and designing with native plants. Um, there's a whole lot of ways to get involved in this. And um, these pollinator pathways often begin with a demonstration garden, typically in a public library or school. Um, and that's a great way to get people interested and to, to get the ball rolling. Um, but the challenge is really to extend the pathway beyond the demonstration garden. Um, and this is a, a map from pollinator pathways showing um, with every icon here, it's a, a pollinator pathway that's been designated already. And as you can see, there's a lot of activity throughout New England. We've got a lot of interest in this um, idea in this area. So what we need to work on is extending out from the demonstration gardens into our own um, yards and into um, public, public places and into our businesses as well. Um, the, the goal that Pollinator Pathways is trying to achieve is to get a um, pollinator planting, a, a density of those so that they're um, no more than a half a mile apart from each other, which is on the scale of the, the range of what a lot of um, the foraging range for a lot of our, our native bees. So by connecting these together and building these networks of pollinator pathways, we can create a lot of connected habitat, which is important to support biodiversity. Okay, and what I want to spend the rest of this presentation talking about in, in a fair degree of depth is a citizen science project called iNaturalist. And this is a collaboration between the National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences, but it's a, a global effort. So they're collecting data from all over the world and it goes into a, a huge global database that um, scientists, scientists have been making use of for several years now. And um, iNaturalist is located at iNaturalist.org. Um, you can access it through on your desktop through a web browser, but you can also download an app onto your smartphone. And this has a very good, very powerful plant identification and insect identification tool on it. All you need to do is be in the iNaturalist app, snap a picture, and that creates an observation that um, you don't have to do anything else beyond that if you don't want to. There are identifiers within um, who use iNaturalist to go and do identifications of the observations that, that people have made and confirm those observations. So um, just by snapping a picture, you can create data that goes into this global database that's very valuable. Another aspect of iNaturalist is there's a, a, social, a social network of professional and am, amateur naturalists. So you can connect up with people that have similar interests um, get involved in their citizen science projects. There's a whole lot of ways that you can um, connect up with other people that are interested in biodiversity. Um, 
as I mentioned, all the observation data that's collected in iNaturalist goes into a, a global database and ecologists and conservationists are making active use of this and designing their research projects and also their, their conservation projects. Um, and the iNaturalist platform is also being used widely for a lot of other citizen science projects as well. Okay, on that pollinator pathways link that I um, have at the bottom of the Plantscapes homepage, um, I've created a, a series of, of pages that can help you get started with this. Um, the first thing that you'll wanna do is create an account in iNaturalist. This is very, very simple. It takes about a minute to set it up. You can either do it on the, the app on your smartphone or um, with a web browser on your desktop or laptop if you prefer. Once you have a, an iNaturalist account, you can join an existing pollinator pathway project. You can also create your own iNaturalist projects. So say you wanna track the native plants that you're putting into your landscape, or you wanna identify the ones that are naturally occurring there, you can create a a project that's just tailored to your own property. Um, you can also do this for your favorite park or nature preserve as well. All that data goes into the, the global database and um, all of it's valuable no matter where you're capturing that information. Um, if you're in a town that doesn't have a pollinator pathway project yet, um, you can also create a pollinator pathway and become its administrator. Um, I'll demonstrate how to, how to do this. It's very easy to set this up. Um, if you do start a new pathway, I'd be interested in finding out about that. Please um, email me at this link and um, I'll add that pollinator pathway to this page and I'll try and keep an eye on how those are developing. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to go back out to my web browser and um, I'll log into iNaturalist and I can show you how easy and intuitive of a, a program it is and show you what the possibilities are for all the things that you can do with it. Okay, so let me go to the iNaturalist. Um, oops, let me go to the iNaturalist homepage first. So <clears throat> this is located again at iNaturalist.org. And you don't need to have an account to access the information that's in iNaturalist. So for example, if you wanted to find the pollinator pathways that are out there, uh, you can just click on a search box and type in pollinator pathway, and it will bring up the pathways that have been created out there already. Um, so you can click on one of these and it will take you to that pollinator pathway. And I've started populating the, the Ledger Connecticut pollinator pathway with some things from my backyard, just as an example. Um, you can get listings of the plants that are in the pathway. If you click on a, an observation, you can see pictures there. So I captured this bumblebee um, foraging in my um, bed of bee balm. And you can also list the observations on a map. 
So all of the observations that I made for this pathway are um, located on the iNaturalist map. And you know, within the limits of the, the GPS capabilities, you can map out your whole property and get pretty good location information on where the, the plants are located. And this is a really good way to keep track of the, the plantings that you're putting into your, your environment. Now, if you want to join up with a pollinator pathway, you will need to um, sign up. So just go up to the, the sign up link and it'll, it will take you to the um, page where you can create an account. Um, it's very simple to do this. It takes less than a minute to, to set up the account. And once you've done that, then you have access to um, all of the different projects that are out there. You can become a member. You can contribute to the, the journals for those pro projects. And you can also start collecting observations. So um, again, if you're at the iNaturalist search box, Yeah. Okay, let me get logged in. Okay. Okay, so I'm going back out to the search box to bring up the pollinator pathway projects again. Because once, you're, once you've created uh, an account in iNaturalist and you wanna join a pathway, do the search and then pull over to the about link. And that will take you to the, the project and it will give you a, an option if you aren't a member already to, to join that pollinator pathway. And once you're in the pathway, you can start making observations and contributing to that pathway. And again, the easiest way to do that is just take your smartphone outside and start clicking pictures within the iNaturalist app and it will start adding your observations to, to the iNaturalist database. And you can tell it to link up to the, the pollinator pathway that you're a member of. And um, <clears throat> another way you can do this, and this is the way that I generally do it, is to go out and take a number of pictures with my my smartphone. And then I come back inside to my desktop or laptop and download those pictures to a um, picture file. And then when you're in the web browser version of iNaturalist, all you need to do is go to this upload button. And that will take you to a browser where you can choose the files that you want to upload. So this is my picture file. And all you do is click on the item that you want to add into your project. And iNaturalist has a very powerful identification software behind it. So it will very often, even if the picture is, is from a distance or, or um, you know, if it doesn't have a lot of detail in it, 
this is very powerful software that will very often choose the, the correct species identification. So that's populated automatically often. Um, if the software can't identify it, as I mentioned, there are identifiers on iNaturalist that um, make it their job to, to go through these observations and try to identify what the species are. Once you've uploaded the observation, you can add it to various projects. So you can add it to a pollinator pathway, um, any other projects that you may have created, um, your own personal um, listing for your, the, the plants in your own property. You can also add notes to this. Um, it's often handy to, um, if you planted something, um, put the date in there that you planted it, maybe um, what the variety is, where you obtained it from. That's all information that um, could be useful down the road. And then once you have that information in, just hit submit. And in a pretty short amount of time, it will enter that observation into the database. And then at that point, you can click on the observation. Um, <clears throat> within the picture data, you can um, magnify it so you can get a better look at the pictures. Um, the picture file data is there, so it contains all the information from your smartphone, including the, the GPS location, so which will um, point to where that, that plant is on the map. So you can expand out this map to, to show exactly where that plant is, is located. Once you have an observation in the database, you can edit it to add even more information. If it's something that you planted there and is not naturally occurring, it's, it's good to note that in the observation. You can add all kinds of notes to the observation. One thing I like to do is if I know what the species is, I put a, a link to the Wikipedia entry for that species. So if I'm out in the field sometime and I come across that plant and I want to get more information on it, if I go into iNaturalist and hit that, that link, it brings up a lot of information um, about that plant from, from Wikipedia or any other sources that you want to link in. Um, to that observation. Um, and some of the things that you can do in iNaturalist too is you can make journal entries. So you can have journal entries that are linked to your account. You can have journal entries that are linked to individual projects. You can also make journal entries to other projects like pollinator pathway projects. And creating projects is really, really easy. Again, I've got these instructions on the, the Plantscapes website, but let me just show you how, how simple it really is. Um, you just go into the projects link, start a project. There are different ways you can do this. The one that I suggest is to do a traditional project because it allows you to put the most information into the database. <clears throat> if you wanna do that, um, you just click on this link. All you have to do is give the project a unique title, um, decide whether you want it to be open to the world or by invite only. Um, you can add a description of the project, which is good, especially if you're inviting other people into the project. And that is pretty much it. You just hit create and it will 
create that project and it will then show up on your project list. Um, again, you can create a project for your backyard. If your town doesn't have a pollinator pathway project, this is exactly what you would do to start a pollinator pathway project for your town and become an, an administrator um, for that, that project. Okay, and then once you have a project going, um, people obviously can in, join that project. Um, and as an administrator, you can give them different levels of access to the, the project. So um, allowing them to edit observations or make journal entries or becoming a, a co-administrator on that project. If a, a project starts to grow quite a bit, you would probably want to have multiple administrators on that project so that um, it can be perpetuated in the, in the future. Um, okay, so um, with that, I encourage you all to, to um, get involved with this, become a member of a, a pathway or a project, um, an administrator, if, if you want to get involved at that level. Um, I hope you see how easy and intuitive this is. And it's a very robust program. So it's, it's impossible to break this. So you don't have to worry about, about um, any of those sort of issues. Um, and now if you have any questions at this point, it's kind of a, a nice place to pause in the talk. Um, if you have any questions in particular about the iNaturalist software, this would be a, a really good time for me to answer those. And then if you have other general questions, we can hold off on those till the end as well. So I'll just check in with Laura and Lisa and see if there's any questions at this point. We're starting our video up again and unmuted ourselves. And I'd ask all of you to unmute if you would like to talk or raise your hand or put something in the chat. So um, I do see a question here and I'm gonna take off my mask. I belong to a lake association in North Stonington. Would you will be willing to discuss this with them? The soil type and the drainage is very different than here in Ledyard. And a lot of time, money in parentheses, is spent to keep commercially available plants alive. And our, as these are mostly summer homes, the amount of care given to the plants is disproportional to the fun you are having. Um, yes, I, I'm... Um absolutely interested in talking with anyone about, about this sort of effort. Um, just kind of a specific answer on that point. Um, when you're establishing new native plantings, the most important thing is providing them with the water they need so that they can get established during that first season. After that point, um, for the most part, if they're sited properly, they'll take care of themselves. So there's very little maintenance involved with native plants after the establishment phase. It's, it's one of the, the big attractions for them. Uh, okay, here's another one. Uh, Laura, would you like to read it or do you want me to? Do you have any advice on dealing with aphids on various milkweeds that are planted for pollinators? Yeah, that's a, a common problem. There's um, there are, natu there are native species of aphids that will feed on milkweed, especially the succulent new tissue and leaves as they're, they're developing. There are also some, some alien um, species of aphids that are attracted to um, milkweed as well. 
the most important consideration is that we're planting these plants, the milkweed for pollinators. So the, the last thing that you wanna do is spray those with some kind of pesticide to protect the plant, which is just going to end up harming the, the pollinators that you're trying to, to support. Um, sometimes the, the best approach to um, insect pests is patience. If we hold back for a, a week or two, the, the ladybugs and the earwigs and the birds will find those aphids. They're a very attractive food source for them. And almost always those natural predators will take care of the, the problem. And the, the native plants are, are adapted to, to deal with a certain amount of feeding like that too, whether it's from aphids or caterpillars or beetles. Um, they're, they're almost always able to handle a little um, chewing on their leaves. Anybody else, any other questions? Feel free to type in the chat if you'd like and we can read the question. Okay, that's great. I will go back to my slides now. Okay, and I just wanna finish up um, with the last segment of the talk by giving a few concrete examples on how this um, iNaturalist software can be used to Okay, am I still, are you able no, to hear? No, Tim, you're, Tim, you're good, sorry. Okay, all right. Um, so I'll just give a, a few quick examples on how this technology is used. And one of the best examples that I've come across that out there of iNaturalist and I, and an iNaturalist project is uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, this is an amazing story of a public-private community initiative that was started about 20 years ago. Um, they had this abandoned industrial site along the East River, and, and including several piers that were um, built out into the river. And it was pretty much just an eyesore, but the, the community decided to get together and convert this area into a park. And with um, a lot of support and effort from that community, um, they built out these, these areas and included you know, like sports fields, there's, there's venues for concerts, but a lot of this area has been planted with mostly native plantings to create a lot of habitat. And the person who's really been driving that effort is Rebecca McMacken, who's the horticultural director for the, the Brooklyn Bridge Park. And Rebecca and her small team of horticulturists were responsible for um, bringing in all the soil, as you can imagine, there was no, no soil on any of these sites. So they had to engineer and truck in all of the, the soil for, for um, these green areas. And then she and her team were responsible for planting this out. So she brought in predominantly native plants. And one of the things that she had her team do as they were planting things was to document all the plants that were being put into this park. And they continued to document all of the bees and butterflies and birds that were being attracted to these plantings. And 
all of that information went into iNaturalist. And um, what it shows is the amount of biodiversity that can be created when you start putting native plants into your landscape. Um, Rebecca McMacken is um, truly and very literally uh, a force of nature also. Um, I encourage you, I've, I've put a lot of links into the speaker notes to her videos and, and she's got a very active blog and um, a very good website. Um, she's really tuned in to the whole ecological gardening network that's out there. And she's a very good source of information. Um, Rebecca and, and her team, in addition to putting a lot of native species into these parks, they've also developed a lot of innovative maintenance methods. And she talks a lot about those in, in her writings. And those are all things that we can learn a lot from as well, not just about putting lots of flowers in the environment for pollinators, but how to create habitat that supports their entire life cycle. Okay, so you can go into iNaturalist and, and search for the Brooklyn Bridge Park um, Biodiversity Project. And this map here is a picture of, of the activity that's been generated in that Brooklyn Bridge Park. And <clears throat> my point here is just to, it's a way for us to imagine how if we created these pollinator pathways in Ledger and in every other town in Connecticut and beyond that, how much information could be put into this database. And again, that information provides data for ecologists and, and conservationists, but those experts can also feed information back into the iNaturalist network to help us as, as those who are interested in biodiversity to um, put plants in our environment that are really going to have the most benefit. And the more data that's available in iNaturalist, the more pathways that we create, um, the more information exchange we'll be able to, to have with those experts. And this is the best way I can think of to build out homegrown national park as well in a very data rich way that we can um, really do a lot to support biodiversity. And in this slide, um, one of my personal initiatives um, has to do with butterflies. I, I love butterflies and one of my favorites is this pipe vine swallowtail. It's a, a beautiful blue butterfly. The caterpillar is also um, very attractive and interesting. It's got some interesting behaviors. And if you look at the historical range map for this butterfly, it extends just up to the border of Connecticut. But if you use iNaturalist and search on pipe vine swallowtail, there have been sightings in our region. So this butterfly is active in our area. And if you decide that you want to attract this environment, uh, butterfly to the local environment, the way you do that is to start planting the, the host plant that its caterpillar needs to feed on um, in order to survive. And the host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail is pipe vine or Dutchman, Dutchman's pipe. It's a, it's a vine with large leaves and um, these interesting flowers. 
And if you look at a range map for the pipeline, it is more predominant further south from us, but there are some counties um, in our area where pipe vine is known to be growing. And again, if you look in iNaturalist, there are several locations in iNaturalist where there are observations for pipe vine. So I planted this <clears throat> plant in my yard several, probably about three years ago. It's getting larger every year. Um, I'm hoping this year to maybe see some caterpillars on there and also um, looking out for the butterfly in, in my backyard. Um, this is just an <clears throat> example of what you can do if you know where the species are, are located, either the host plant or the insect that you're trying to support, how you can use that information to um, create conditions that are going to attract that um, life form into your, your local environment and what you can do to support it. And one of the really critical ways that, critically important ways that we could use that is to support the endangered species that are out there. So um, again, conservationists can feed information back to us as iNaturalist users on what those target species are so that we can start putting plants in our environment that support them. And perhaps we can, um, with a lot of intention, we can bring, bring those species back from the brink of extinction. Okay, and this is my last slide. Um, I just wanna show here that the possibilities for pollinator pathway projects are truly endless. It's something that um, every library um, and school could get involved in. Um, the projects are great for students and scouts. Um, there's a lot of activity already from garden clubs. Um, a lot of the garden clubs have um, been working on native plantings for many years now, so they have a lot of experience with it. Um, and also master gardeners. So if you're a master gardener looking for a project, um, I would strongly encourage you to start a pollinator pathway project. And, or if one already exists, take it on as a, um, become a member and um, try and get the word out as widely as possible so that we can get as many people involved with the pathways as, as possible. And finally, a uh, pollinator pathway project is something that every single town in this country could take on and the towns could find ways to encourage the residents to, to get involved with this as well. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. I wanna thank you all very much for taking the time um, for attending and for your attention. And if there's any more questions at this point, I'll be happy to take those. I'm gonna un unmute. All right, everybody, I see one. Uh, for those local to Southeastern Connecticut, I just wanted to share that we got several varieties of native plants. Let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, several plant, uh, several varieties of native, native plant seeds from a local group called Wild Ones Mountain Laurel Connecticut Chapter. They have a Facebook page of the same name and their website is wildones.org. They host seed sales a couple times a year. They advocate for the use of local native plants in natural landscaping, restoration, and environment, and then, excuse me, and environmental education. Right, and it looks like we got three new messages. So uh, uh, thank you for the very informative talk. Thanks for the talks. Thank you all. Um, so thank you for the thank yous, everybody. And uh, is there anything else, any other questions? Okay. If there aren't any other questions, 
we definitely would like to thank Tim for his time and his expertise. And for those of you that might not know, this week is Pollinator Week, a national celebration and bringing awareness of the importance and how to protect pollinators. So this presentation was perfectly timed. Thank you for letting us know about that, Tim. And we will be posting his recording and speaker notes on the Legend Public Library website. So we'll do that in a few days, get that up. And I just wanted to mention that our local Ledger Garden Club has put in a beautiful rain garden right here in Ledger at, at our library, at the Bill Library. So if anyone's around, please come and visit it. It's beautiful. They've done an amazing job. We have a patio here at the library where you can sit and enjoy the, the garden and enjoy a cup of tea or whatever you'd like. Um, but it's really a treasure to have that right here because it's wonderful to look at and enjoy. And while you're enjoying your cup of tea or coffee on the patio, there's also an outlet out there. <laughs> uh, so umbrellas uh, for you to stay in the shade if you'd like to the tables and uh, an outlet so we can plug in your laptop because we have Wi-Fi on the patio as well as the parking lot. So again, please feel free to come and enjoy that. Again, thank you, Tim. We appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you, Tim. It was great. And thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank thanks again, so everyone. Have a great evening. You too. And stay tuned for our upcoming programs from the Legend Seed Library. Thank you. Good night, everyone.